Welcome to this series on biological anthropology. We're going to be using an open source textbook called Explorations, an open invitation to biological anthropology. And you can find that at the link shown below. So our first chapter is called The Introduction to Biological Anthropology. And we're going to be looking at several different uh, vocabulary definitions here. First, we're going to define anthropology and the four subdisciplines of anthropology, which are cultural, linguistic, archaeology, and biological anthropology. Then we're going to dive in deeper into biological anthropology and look at some of the major subfields, such as primatology, paleoanthropology, molecular biology, bioarchaeology, forensics, and human biology. Finally, we're going to wrap things up by explaining the scientific method and how anthropologists can use this in their investigations. We're also going to differentiate between what is the hypothesis, theory, or a law. So what is anthropology? Anthropology is the study of humans. And as I stated, there are four subdisciplines. So there are different ways of studying humans. We might study uh, human cultures that no longer exist, and we can use the archeological record to do that by digging up ancient sites, looking at human remains um, and other materials that those uh, people have left behind, such as pottery, tools, um, stone and metal artifacts. We can also look at cultural anthropology. That's going to investigate modern living societies. There's biological anthropology, which is what this class is going to focus on. And then linguistic anthropology, which looks at languages and the differences among languages and how they change. So let's talk a little bit about cultural anthropology. Again, this one is gonna focus on living societies. And one thing I want you to think about is something called cultural relativism. So the idea of cultural relativism is that you need to suspend judgment and seek to understand another culture on its own terms. This can be very difficult for people to do. So if you're a cultural anthropologist, you need to make sure that when you're observing and recording information on someone else's culture, that you're not judging them based on your own culture. You have to be very open-minded and you're trying not to interfere either. So this is especially true when you're studying indigenous uh, societies that might be very different from yours. Another vocabulary term related to that is something called ethnocentrism, which is the idea that you basically believe that your own culture is the best one and that's the only right way of doing things. So again, if you're a cultural anthropologist, you wanna kind of suspend that type of behavior. So one example for you that I'd like to talk about is a really interesting study on a tribe in Papua New Guinea where there was an unusual medical condition that those people were experiencing. And it was actually some anthropologists that discovered the source of that disease. So what was happening to the people is that they were having uh, nervous sy uh, system symptoms where they were shaking, uh, acting unusually, laughing uncontrollably, and eventually they would pass away from this illness. And people were not sure how they were getting it, like where was it coming from? So anthropologists that studied this tribe were finally able to figure out that the reason they were getting this disease, which is called Kuru, is that they participated in something called ritual funeralistic cannibalism. And this is where, again, ethnocentrism is a big deal because normally when you think of cannibalism, you think, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Why are you eating another person? But in this society, they were doing this as a sign of respect. So when someone passed away, the family members would consume parts of that person's body as part of the funeral rites. And what was happening is they were spreading a disease, a prion disease, which is a type of malformed protein that affects the brain and changes your behavior. So because they were eating the, the body parts of this deceased person, they were catching that prion disease and they were becoming infected as well. So once the anthropologists were able to figure out the situation and what was causing this illness, they were, they were able to explain it to the society and that they needed to stop eating uh, the dead people if they wanted to stop the spread of Kuru. And this actually did work. And so the incidence of Kuru uh, basically disappeared. Okay, now another subdiscipline is archaeology. You're probably familiar with this one. So people go uh, to to ancient sites and they dig up the, the remains that they find there. Sometimes it's buildings, sometimes it's tools, uh, things like pottery, depending on how old the society is. And sometimes if it's quite ancient, then you're going to mostly be looking at stone tools rather than metal tools. In linguistic anthropology, we're going to be studying the idea of human languages. 
And one really interesting thing about that is that, again, this is sort of ethnocentric, but the idea that only humans have true language. So you can learn that there are quite a few animal language studies that look at other intelligent species such as dolphins, parrots, and non-human primates like gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees, and they want to study how well those animals can learn language. And so there's many studies that look at like sign language or symbolic language using um, pictures and pictograms, and they are able to teach these animals vocabulary, but the ability to teach grammar rules is very limited. So most of these animals are not able to put more than a couple words together in a sentence. They're not able to add gr a grammatical context to so things like future tense, past tense, and so forth. So the idea of modern human language, which is quite complex, it goes across all human species and all the different human subcultures. But we do think it's a very unique human attribute and it has to do with our brain development. And we're going to learn more about the evolution of the human brain. Another interesting thing that uh, comes up is something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So the idea of linguistic relativity is that your perception of reality and your perception of your world is influenced by your language. And one of the ways that they've studied this is they looked at things like how many different terms a culture would have for colors and whether people could distinguish between colors. And so it's definitely a controversial kind of theory because the human biology of the eye should be the same across different cultures. So what you can actually physically see with your eye and the rods and the cones that are in your eye should be the same no matter what kind of human you are. However, in terms of our perception of reality and what we focus on, our language can influence that. So if you live in a culture where, for example, there's no difference between the color yellow and green, you only have one word for that color, then how are you going to describe to someone if you saw something yellow or green? You'd have to use the same word. So it basically influences how you're able to communicate and how you're able to remember things and describe things. Okay, so biological anthropology, that's what the focus of this class is going to be. And we're gonna be looking at lots of different things like modern humans. So how is our modern biology related to our evolutionary history? For example, maybe living in different environments and how we've adapted to those environments, whether they're cold, warm, tropical, desert-like, and things like that. We also look further back in history and look at human evolution, including uh, non-humans. So basically our primate ancestors we also look at modern primates and do comparisons between humans and modern primates. And then we also look at our human ancestors, which are called hominins. There is a subdiscipline called applied anthropology. The idea of applied anthropology is that you're combining all the other four subdisciplines. So the archaeology, the cultural anthropology, the biological anthropology, the linguistic anthropology, you'd be combining all of that and applying it to a specific situation to help solve real world examples. So one idea of that would be something like medical anthropology, where we look at how your culture and how your um, evolutionary background all influence the health of today's society. So think of something like how uh, people who have evolved in Africa, a lot of times they have a higher chance of a disease called sickle cell anemia. And we know that there's a relationship between the frequency of the sickle cell anemia gene and the exposure to malaria. So we've found that correlation that people whose ancestors lived in places where malaria, which is a very deadly disease, uh, was highly prevalent, have a higher incidence of that gene. On the other hand, you can also look at how uh, cultural behaviors can influence things like spread of disease, like I just mentioned to you with the Kuru and how it had to do with the behavior of that society that was spreading the disease. So here's a review question for you. And after I read the question, you can pause, think about it and try to answer that question. So can you name the four subdisciplines of anthropology? And then my next question for you is what best describes the focus of archeology? span Is it A, the material culture people leave behind, including tools, food, and shelters? B, finding valuable artifacts? C, studying prehistoric societies? Or D, human origins and evolution? Okay, so are you ready to answer? The four subdisciplines sub of anthropology should have been cultural, linguistic, archeology, span and biological anthropology. 
And in terms of which choice is the best for the focus of archaeology, the answer should have been A, it's the material culture that people leave behind. So now let's look more at biological anthropology. The idea is to use a scientific and evolutionary approach to look at how uh, humans have evolved and basically look the way that they do now. So why do we have our physical differences as well as our physical similarities? So here's some questions that you can answer. What is the place of humans in nature? So we definitely look at how we compare to other animals, especially other primates. How are humans related to other organisms? That has to do with our evolutionary relationships. What makes humans unique? So I mentioned to you that language is something that's unique to humans. That's a behavioral thing, but there is a genetic background to it and there is a biological background to it and it has to do with brain anatomy. What are human origins? What influenced human evolution? How and when did humans migrate? So that's a really interesting question. We can use the fossil record to see how uh, humans ended up all over the world where they live today. How are humans today similar or different from one another? And what influences human patterns of variation? Now, within biological anthropology, which is a large category of anthropology, there are a bunch of sub-disciplines. These include primatology, paleoanthropology, bioarchaeology, molecular anthropology, forensic anthropology, and human biology. So let's look at each of those in more detail. Primatology has to do with studying both living and extinct non-human primates. So in this image, we see a gorilla. We also have some other very closely related uh, primate species, such as chimpanzees. In fact, um, chimpanzees and humans are very, very closely related in terms of their DNA. Then in paleoanthropology, we're going to study human ancestors. So human ancestors are going to fall into a category called hominins. Hominins are species that are regarded as human and are directly ancestral to humans. So right now only Homo sapiens exists, but there are other species that did exist in the past which have gone extinct and we can find their fossil record. So something like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, all of those guys are very closely related to modern humans. And that would fall into that category of paleoanthropology, studying the human ancestors. In this image, we have um, a man called Donald uh, Johansson. And what happened with him is he was able to discover kind of what we call the missing link, which was a very important fossil, which showed the evolution of humans and was a missing link between um, our common ancestor with other uh, apes, so chimpanzees and gorillas, and the modern human. So the name of that fossil was called Lucy, and she was discovered in the 1970s, and you will learn a lot more about her in this class. Next, we have molecular anthropology, which is going to be comparing the DNA of different populations. And as I mentioned before, a really interesting fact is that humans and chimps actually share over 98% of their DNA. Now, humans with other humans is over 99% of their DNA in common. Um, so we actually have a lot more in common than we have different. But those small differences, those small mutations can help explain the physical differences that we see amongst each other. Speaking of differences, so human biology is a category which will study how the human body is impacted by the environment, nutrition, and culture. And the reason that's really interesting is because you, you see this lady in this picture, she lives in the Andes Mountains, which are really, really high elevation. So when you study indigenous pro, uh, populations, indigenous means that those people were the original settlers of that region and they've lived there for a long period of time. Many times their genetics and their biology can be influenced by their environment. And so what we study here, is how would humans acclimate to high elevations? This is something that can happen even to you. So let's say you live at sea level. So you're used to sea level. If you move to the mountains over time, your body will adapt to that new environment and you will see changes in things like your red blood cells and in your lung capacity. So that can happen within a human that's called acclimatization. But over long periods of time, in terms of evolution, we can study that by studying these indigenous people to see what's different about them compared to people who do not have ancestors from these higher elevations. And one really interesting study on that is if you've heard of Mount Everest, which I'm sure you've heard of, very tall mountain, it's really, really difficult to climb that mountain due to the very low oxygen levels at the top of the mountain. And so for a, a general mountain climber, when they first get there, they have to acclimatize to that environment. So they can't just climb up Mount Everest in one day and be done with it. That's not going to work because they would run out of breath and they would get very sick. 
Instead, it takes many, many days of getting used to that elevation. Now, there are people who live in that region uh, in Tibet who are indigenous people, and they often help these mountain climbers. They're called Sherpas, and the Sherpas have more unique biology because they their ancestors have lived there for many, many, many generations. And so they're much more adapted to that higher elevation, and they don't get sick as easily as someone who's coming in from a different um, elevation. OK, next subfield, bioarchaeology, is going to be the study of human remains. And this image is a very famous image of um, a body that they found that was over 5,000 years old, and it was preserved in ice. So they named him Otsi the Iceman. And it was a very interesting study because not only was his body preserved, but also uh, the tools he was using, some of his clothing, his hair, even um, his stomach and things that he had been eating were intact. So we learned a lot of information from that. On the other hand, something like forensic anthropology, forensic anthropology usually focuses on the bones and so forensic anthropology can be used to solve modern crimes, for example, where we find a body that has decomposed so much that the soft tissue is no longer useful in identifying that person, we can use their skeleton because there's a lot of very unique features in the skeleton that can help you identify things like their age, whether they're male or female, and other unique features of them. We can also use forensic anthropology to discover more about people who died a long time ago. So even you know hundreds of years ago, um, so that would kind of go along with archaeology, where in archaeology they look at the material remains around the person, but also their skeleton. Okay, so my next review question for you, and again, please pause it to think about the answer. All of the following are questions that a biological anthropologist might address, except A, what influenced human evolution? B, how genetically similar are various human populations? C, how are we related to primates? Or D, how have languages diversified over time? So the correct answer should have been D. Languages is something that a linguistic anthropologist would study. Now let's wrap it up by recognizing science. So science is the study of the physical natural world, but anytime you use a scientific study or explanation, it must be testable and refutable. So that's different from uh, when someone just says like, oh, I have a theory that this happened or that happened. They're probably not using the term theory in the scientific context, okay? If it's being used in scientific uh, context, it's something that has to be testable. So that you need to be able to provide evidence that either supports your idea or refutes it, meaning it, it's showing that the evidence um, means that you're incorrect, okay? So that has to be part of the scientific process. It also has to have empirical or observable evidence. And it is uh, self-correcting over time, meaning that other people can repeat your experiment and they can find new evidence and the new evidence might actually contradict your evidence and that's okay. That's how we're able to change our, our theories over time and make them better. So the actual scientific method, if you haven't heard of it before, it's the process the scientists use. And we start with observations, then we come up with our hypotheses, which are statements. Then we have our predictions, and then we're going to test that prediction, and either the hypothesis is supported by our data or it's rejected. So here's an example for you in a way that an anthropologist might approach this. We might have a question such as, what came first in human evolution? Our big brains or our bipedalism? And if you don't know what bipedalism means, it means walking on two legs. So all modern humans walk on two legs, that's natural for us, but our ape ancestors did not do so. Because if you look at modern living apes, they use a different method called a knuckle walking, which means they're still using all four of their limbs to run around on the ground. We also have even further back ancestors that clearly lived in the trees, okay? So things like monkeys and even our, our ape um, relatives, orangutans, they live in the trees. So what came first? Was it the human's big brain or was it the bipedalism? And our observation is that Amongst all current living apes, we are the only ones, the humans are the only ones that are walking bipedally all the time. Our hypothesis could be something like big brains evolved first. If we think this is true, then our predictions should say that if we look up fossils of early human ancestors, we're going to find something called a large cranium. So the cranium is the bones that surround your brain. And the larger your cranium, the larger your brain. We would also expect that the legs and the feet of this human ancestor would still show signs of either knuckle walking 
or arboreal behavior. So arboreal meaning living up in the trees. And we would see evidence of that rather than it being bipedal. So how are we gonna test this? We're going to find some fossils and we can actually find the age of fossils. We'll talk about that more in the future. We can find out if it's you know, 1 million years old, 2 million years old, 3 million years old. And we can look at those fossils and find out their age and compare them to modern humans and compare them to modern apes and see what do they have more in common? Do they have that larger cranium or do they have uh, legs and feet that show bipedalism? And I will tell you the answer to this in a future lesson uh, because we did find fossil evidence that answers this question, but that will come up more later. So the last bit here is some vocabulary for you. So what's the difference between a hypothesis, a theory and a law? A hypothesis is a specific statement that you would make when you want to create an experiment. So it only looks at a narrow set of phenomenon and it's going to try to explain um, what you're predicting is going to happen. It does have to be testable and it has to rely on that empirical evidence. So you need to be able to collect some observable data that will either support your hypothesis or refute it. In comparison, a theory is a much larger, broader statement it's going to be a wider range of phenomenon. So that one, usually many, many different hypotheses have kind of been combined together to show that this theory is true. One example would be the theory of natural selection. So we'll talk about that again in another chapter, but the theory of natural selection is the explanation for why evolution occurs. And there've been many, many experiments showing support for that theory. Finally, a law is a prediction uh, of what will happen in given certain conditions. And there's usually a mathematical formula involved with a law. So example like law of gravity, it, usually you see it in physics. You also see it with um, different kind of biological laws uh, that we'll learn about for the human body. But those are a little bit different than theories and hypotheses. And that wraps it up for chapter one.